Royal weddings create headlines all over the world. People love a wedding anyway, but they especially love it if the Queen and others are involved. You know that there's two and a half billion people around the world tuned into it, watching it. Everyone's together, they're all like feeling part of something, it's brilliant, I love it. In the ultimate fairy tale. The way the wedding has been put together, it is theatre, it is drama. Way beyond any normal nuptials. Can you imagine the pressure to produce picture-perfect happiness? Normal weddings, you can't wear white, you can't outshine the bride, but I thought there's so much going on today that I wouldn't possibly outshine her. As royal commentators dispel the myth of the monarchy. If you're a child in the royal family and you're hoping to grow up and go to an ordinary school, you can forget it. They ended up with the king doing the conga round the state rooms of Buckingham Palace. Experts will break down key archive from crucial moments in royal history. It was a fairy tale created by the Grimm brothers. Anybody entering the royal circles needs to come with their A game. So prepare to discover what actually happens when blue blood runs red. What have you been doing in here all day? This is The Royals Revealed. This episode, over the last century, two royal weddings have captured our imaginations above all others. Thousands jam the square before Buckingham Palace and the cry goes up, we want Elizabeth. They've put a broad smile on the face of the nation. You know that it's the only story in town, you know that it's an exciting day, very early start. One of post-war pageantry, which redefined what was possible in austere times. I think they also had salmon to start with and to finish with, they had actually cherries and ice cream. But it wasn't even fresh cherries, it was those glazed cherries. Princess Elizabeth, she actually saved up coupons during the course of the war to make this wedding dress. The other, a spectacle with no expense spared. We think that William and Kate's wedding cost around the region of £23 million. Uh, the flower budget alone was £800,000, so it was quite a costly affair and they received many, many things, including a cinema, a racehorse, and one of my favorite presents that they got are two pieces of burnt toast. But whilst these two grand affairs may be remembered as perfect days... They had a wedding ball two nights before the wedding, and no expense was spared on that. It's just one of the best days of the year, best days of the century. It seems strange to think there was a time when the prospect of both marriages hung in the balance. Over 80 years previously in Italy, the makeup of the monarchy could have all changed when the young Prince Philip was just 17. Philip was in Venice in 1938 because two years previously they had suffered a family tragedy when his sister had been killed in a car crash. And he was a little adrift. He'd always led a nomadic childhood, effectively being passed from pillar to post because his mother was mentally unstable and his family life was extremely broken. That is where he met Cabina Wright. And she was a very beautiful young girl. And Philip was a very handsome young man. And they had um, a romance. With ambitions to be a star of stage and screen, American Cabina Wright headed for London's West End. Philip took the cue to follow. They spent a very intense um, time together in Venice and then in London for at least a week where they were spotted wandering around holding hands. There was this sense that he was quite entranced by Cabina um, because of her beauty, but also the sense of allure she had in somebody that was going to make it, was going to be famous, was going to be um, somebody talked about on stage and screen. After decades of speculation, the extent of their relationship was only revealed after Cabina's passing in 2011. Cabina Wright's obituary revealed that they were much closer than, than any of us imagine and that they were madly in love. And when she left to return to America, you know, Philip was almost sobbing at the thought of, of losing her. And he used to write her impassioned love letters. 
Cabina ultimately married Army Corporal Palmer Beaudet, though she is said to have kept a photo of Philip close to hand for the rest of her life. Prince William had also had his dalliances before hooking up with his future bride. At one point, he was linked with Emma Parker Bowles, of all people, obviously related to Camilla Parker Bowles. And equally, um, he was linked to Alexandra Natchpole, who's a descendant of Mountbatten. Again, very close relations to the royal family. But the girl who really put Kate's nose out of joint was Jekka Craig, who was a long-term girlfriend of Prince William's before Kate was on the scene, and who still maintained a friendship with William after they broke up. And there was a bit of controversy apparently at William's 21st birthday party because it seemed as if Jekka had been given pride of place alongside him and not Kate. By graduation, William and Kate were officially an item. Very soon, Kate Middleton could be one of the most famous women in the world, and yet she must try to forge a career on her own terms. The future was also far from certain for distant cousins Elizabeth and Philip, who by 1946 had begun to share each other's company at royal gatherings. I think Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was a little bit more uh, uh, attuned to it and obviously noticed that her daughter were, you know, used to flush red every time Philip came into the room. But I still don't think they thought there was, there was absolutely any possibility of a marriage. I mean, they had uh, Elizabeth lined up to, to marry a member of the British aristocracy. That's what they wanted for her. Whether he was mindful of these doubts or not, Philip popped the question. He proposed to her at Balmoral, and we know nothing more. We would all love to know how he did it. Did he go on one knee? Where was it? But I don't know either. It's lost in the mists of time, or no one is ever going to say. George VI didn't want it to be uh, made public because Elizabeth was only 20, and 21 then was the key age. And I think George VI felt that Elizabeth needed to be 21 before all the fuss that would be made when the engagement was announced. And they said, OK, OK, but steady on, steady on. Let's, let's just keep this quiet for the moment. With the king setting out his stall, the budding courtship was put on hold but their impatience to get to the altar would be nothing compared to what their grandson's betrothed had to put up with decades later. <laughs> Royal weddings are one of the biggest events of the year. But just like for any couple who tie the knot, the path to walk down the aisle can have bumps along the way. Not least for Kate and William, and Elizabeth and Philip. The latter were now engaged unofficially, but forbidden to tell anyone and about to be separated as the royal set sail for a South African tour. They were in a way trying to test her relationship with Prince Philip and see if it would go the distance, whether this secret engagement would stand the test of time and whether Philip was up to the task and wasn't going to stray. But I don't think going to South Africa or any other things that uh, Elizabeth did, I don't think they ever really dented the relationship at all. And George VI knew that. She never forgot Philip, and she wrote to him constantly. So they were in touch. They weren't exiled from each other. They were just apart from each other. I think the decision of the relationship was all Princess Elizabeth. She's the one that fell in love with Philip. She's the one that decided this is the only man in my life and this is the man I'm going to marry and marry she did. Whilst Elizabeth had clearly made up her mind, 60 years later, an heir presumptive was surrounded by an air of doubt. When William and Kate broke up in 2007, I think it was largely due to William having cold feet and perhaps thinking unwisely that he should sow his royal oats rather than be tied down to somebody that he'd met really relatively young at university. I've got a theory about the relationship breaking up. Catherine was being hassled unmercifully by the media wherever she went. And I think there was a, a planned breakup just to take the pressure off Catherine that once the relationship had been broken, there was no longer any interest. There was interest then on who would William uh, chase after. 
So the focus was away from Catherine and on to William. When it was initially reported that they had broken up, I phoned Kate and said, look, this story's broken. We need to follow it up in tomorrow's newspaper. Have you got any comment to make? And she said very politely and very calmly, look, I've never commented or spoken to the press in the past and I'm certainly not going to start now, but thank you for your interest. And I remember finding myself saying, well, thank you. <laughs> Good luck. I hope all goes well for you. Because at that point, of course, we thought that she would just be a Wikipedia entry in Prince William's life. Um, and then a few months later, when she appeared at the concert for Diana, um, it was apparent that she was still very much on the scene and that I think William had realised he'd made a gigantic error and returned to her somewhat with his tail between his legs. In July 1947, nearly a year after he proposed, Philip's engagement to Elizabeth was finally made public. The athletic Philip, whose six foot two inch frame had caused many a feminine heart to flutter, had agreed to give up any claim to the Greek throne and dutifully became a British commoner. The last obstacle to their promised marriage had been overcome. The heart of the world is thrilled by the prospect of one royal wedding with a genuine aura of romance. But the upbeat news reports belied some unease behind the scenes. There was still suspicion around Prince Philip as they announced their engagement because of his connections to Germans. I think a poll was carried out at the time which suggested that 40% of the British public were opposed to the marriage. There were elements in the royal family or among the advisers who still didn't really feel this was the best thing simply because Philip had this sort of foreign aura. And the prospective in-laws still weren't too keen. And they thought for their daughter they could do better. They thought too, not just about their daughter's happiness, but they also thought about support for her when she eventually became queen. Was Philip the right man? Apparently the queen mother used to refer to Prince Philip in quite disparaging terms um, as the Hun, um, which was seemingly a joke born out of the fact that Philip's sisters were married to SS officers. and. Uh, the Queen Mother never made any secret of her distrust of the Nazi regime, let's put it that way. Did Queen Mother call Philip the Hun? Well, it's one of those apocryphal stories that, that's grown up to become fact. And it's a bit rich, actually, <laughs> Queen Elizabeth referring to Prince Philip as the Hun because she married into a German family because George V uh, was, until 1917, the family name was Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. Uh, which derives from when Queen Victoria married Prince Albert in 1842. Fortunately for William and Kate, when the prince had finally done the deed, the reaction was rather more positive. Well, you've been a couple for quite a long time. Prince William, why did it take you so long to propose? And Catherine, did you ever worry that he actually wasn't ever going to pop the question? Well, in answer to that, Tim, uh, I don't remember how many years it's been. Uh, forget from memory. Um, I also didn't realise it was a race, otherwise I probably would have been a lot quicker. And unlike most other husbands-to-be, William hadn't needed to frequent some high-end jewellers to find a ring fit for his queen. When the couple announced their engagement, there was a press conference at St James's Palace, but before that, selected journalists were invited to just have a cup of tea with them. So I said, oh, can I see the engagement ring? And she showed me and I looked at it. I thought, this looks familiar. I said, wow, that's amazing. And she said, yes, it was William's mother's, so it's very special. And I remember thinking, <laughs> you're not kidding. Back in 1981, the ring reveal had caused quite a stir. At three o'clock, Prince Charles and Lady Diana appeared for the first time in public. And this was the first chance to see the ring of sapphires and diamonds. I think when it was purchased, the engagement ring cost £400,000, and I suppose now, considering its legacy and heritage, it's priceless. In stark contrast, the penniless Prince Philip had to think outside the box for Elizabeth's ring. When they left Greece, um, Prince Philip was carted off with his mother in a, in, in a cardboard box. Uh, to, to sort of wander around Europe. Philip was very, very small at the time. Uh, she did manage to um, sneak out a few bits of jewellery, uh, one of which was a tiara, which she gave to Philip, 
which Philip eventually broke up, and it went to make up the engagement ring. When he presented it to the princess, it was just a little big, but she was so excited she wanted to wear it anyway. And she said it didn't matter that it was a bit big. Um, it, obviously, it went back to be altered eventually, but she was so excited and she was thrilled to think that he designed it himself. And basically, the Queen has never taken it off. And it, it's her, definitely her favorite, favorite piece of jewelry. As Diana's diamond twinkled on Kate's finger, the media started to take aim at her family. As you know, Catherine and Prince William have been going out together for quite a number of years, which is great for us because we've got to know William really well. We all think he's wonderful and we're extremely fond of him. There was a lot of criticism as well that people forget of her seemingly being lazy, not really having a proper job, waiting around like a doormat to be proposed to. There's a sense that there wasn't much to her. There was also a great deal of criticism of her mother, Carol, um, having been an air hostess, and she was dubbed doors to manual in the press. Um, Kate and her sister Pippa were referred to as wisteria sisters in that they were terribly fragrant and with a ferocious ability to climb. Um, so there was a sense that, on one hand, the Middletons were these pushy and aspirational middle-class family desperate to break into the royal fold. With both engagements announced, the build-ups could begin and time was of the essence. I suppose the Queen and the King were keen for her to get married because you've got to remember George VI was very ill. Princess Elizabeth was already standing in for him on certain engagements and he probably felt secretly that he didn't have long in this life and therefore I suppose it was necessary that she did settle down with somebody that she loved. Elizabeth and Philip also had to contend with wedding planning in a time of post-war austerity and faced particular difficulties with regards to the bridal gown. There was controversy in certain sections of the media over the wedding dress uh, that it, it seemed to have cost a lot of money. We were still in rationing, so how many coupons went to make up this rather extravagant looking bridal gown. There's a lot of talk that people actually sent in coupons, but uh, the royal family being the royal family, they didn't accept unsolicited gifts and the coupons were sent back to the senders. She was sent all kinds of uh, uh, bolts of cloth. She was sent nylon stockings. I mean, the public really entered into the spirit of this wedding. So how did the princess afford her dress? The government were really quite generous uh, at the time. They gave uh, Princess Elizabeth 200 coupons, which she actually saved up. She'd also saved the coupons during the course of the war to make this wedding dress and look absolutely terrific in what was a grand occasion. Of course, the dress is the talk of literally every wedding. So when it comes to the royals, that intrigue goes into overdrive. Look at that wonderful girl. And this fascination goes right the way back to Queen Victoria. Before Victoria, weddings were quiet affairs, even in the royal family. They take place at night and brides could wear any colour. Victoria and her ministers, they think this wedding is a really good way of showing how perfect and virtuous I am. So they bring in the idea of the royal wedding and it will be all about purity and her virginity. So she will wear white and her bridesmaids will wear white. And also it will be public in terms of driving to the wedding in the afternoon so all the crowds can see her in her open carriage. This is radical, really revolutionary in terms of royal wedding. She brought in the white wedding dress and a lot of people at the time thought the white wedding dress was very bizarre. They thought it looked like she was wearing her nightgown or some kind of peasant outfit. And really everyone thought the white dress was really a bit odd, but it caught on. Everyone had to buy it. 141 years later, Diana's epic David Emmanuel number with a 25-foot train had been so hyped that bridal designers had stitched up a plan to create a copy in record time. Designer Mrs. Rosie Joseph took just 15 minutes to sketch the outline. Then the two dozen workers rolled up their sleeves to produce an instant copy. The dress is not an exact replica. It's in polyester. Silk is too expensive. It's white, not creamy. 
and the train is just 12 feet long. Finally, the lookalike dress was modelled by a supposed lookalike princess. I think if you speak to the Emmanuels who designed the dress and veil, it was to create a look of drama. And considering the dress was enormous and <laughs> very much typical of the 1980s meringue. After weeks of speculation, Kate was ready to unveil her choice of wedding gown. The secret was about to be revealed. The first glimpse of the world's most talked about dress. Lace, v-neck with a veil, through the window of the car taking her to Westminster Abbey, details were at last emerging. It was only when Kate Middleton stepped from the car that the picture was complete. As both Princess Elizabeth and Kate Middleton wowed making their grand entrances, they'd each insisted on some uniquely personal touches. Interestingly as well, both the Queen and Kate insisted on doing their own wedding makeup, which shocked observers in Kate's case because obviously having a makeup artist at a celebrity wedding is the done thing. Um, and to be fair, the Duchess of was always insisted on doing her own makeup, being criticised for it, but she did her makeup how she likes it. Despite her, her beautiful couture dress, the Queen didn't want to have uh, her makeup applied by somebody else because in, in those days makeup could be could be very thick and very unattractive. But the future queen's composed look hid a last minute panic behind the scenes. The biggest incident for the princess on her wedding day was that her tiara broke and the catch on the back of the tiara snapped. But luckily it was whisked round the corner to Garrod and Co in Regent Street where they welded it together and sent it straight back to Buckingham Palace again. Phew. But if you look very carefully, the one side is slightly higher than the other side. And um, it served its purpose, but it has subsequently been repaired properly because the Princess Royal used it uh, for her wedding in 1973. And more recently, Princess Beatrice wore it for her wedding. On Beatrice's wedding day, it's very slightly skew with and that's because you have to be very careful with that troublesome catch at the back. So as both brides entered Westminster Abbey, it was finally time to get hitched. But that wouldn't be the only hitch along the way. And her bridesmaids will wear white. And also it'll be public in terms of driving to the wedding in the afternoon so all the crowds can see her in her open carriage. This is radical, really revolutionary in terms of royal wedding. She brought in the white wedding dress. And a lot of people at the time thought the white wedding dress was very bizarre. They thought it looked like she was wearing her nightgown or some kind of peasant outfit. And really everyone thought the white dress was really a bit odd. But it caught on. Everyone had to buy it. 41 years later, Diana's epic David Emmanuel number with a 25-foot train had been so hyped that bridal designers had stitched up a plan to create a copy in record time. Designer Mrs Rosie Joseph took just 15 minutes to sketch the outline. Then the two dozen workers rolled up their sleeves to produce an instant copy. The dress is not an exact replica. It's in polyester. Silk is too expensive. It's white, not creamy. And the train is just 12 feet long. Finally, the lookalike dress was modelled by a supposed lookalike princess. I think if you speak to the Emmanuels who designed the dress and veil, it was to create a look of drama. And considering the dress was enormous and <laughs> very much typical of the 1980s meringue. After weeks of speculation, Kate was ready to unveil her choice of wedding gown. The secret was about to be revealed. The first glimpse of the world's most talked about dress. Lace, v-neck, with a veil, through the window of the car taking her to Westminster Abbey, details were at last emerging. It was only when Kate Middleton stepped from the car that the picture was complete. Both Princess Elizabeth and Kate Middleton wowed making their grand entrances. They'd each insisted on some uniquely personal touches. Interestingly as well, both the Queen and Kate insisted on doing their own wedding makeup, which 
shocked observers in Kate's case because obviously having a makeup artist at a celebrity wedding is the done thing. Um, and to be fair, the Duchess has always insisted on doing her own makeup, being criticised for it, but she did her makeup how she likes it. Despite her, her beautiful couture dress, the Queen didn't want to have uh, her makeup applied by somebody else because in, in those days makeup could be, could be very thick and very unattractive. But the future Queen's composed look hid a last-minute panic behind the scenes. The biggest incident for the Princess on her wedding day was that her tiara broke and the catch on the back of the tiara snapped. But luckily, it was whisked round the corner to Garrard and King in Regent Street, where they welded it together and sent it straight back to Buckingham Palace again. Phew. But if you look very carefully, the one side is slightly higher than the other side. And um, it served its purpose. But it has subsequently been repaired properly because the Princess Royal used it uh, for her wedding in 1973. And more recently, Princess Beatrice wore it for her wedding. On Beatrice's wedding day, it's very slightly skew and that's because you have to be very careful with that troublesome catch at the back. So as both brides entered Westminster Abbey, it was finally time to get hitched. But that wouldn't be the only hitch along the way. As a royal wedding gets into full swing, tens of thousands of well-wishers will line the streets to try and get a taste of the matrimonial fanfare. Some will even camp out overnight to catch one momentary glimpse of majesty. We'll have a great time, won't we, Case? Yeah! Yeah! And as each bride carefully climbs the steps to her ceremony and leaves the cheering masses outside, the rare moment of intimacy at the altar hasn't always gone to plan. Diana had a bit of a problem at the altar because uh, when Archbishop of Canterbury said to her, do you take uh, this man, Charles Philip Arthur George, uh, to be your lawful wedded husband, Diana got the names mixed up. Hi, Diana Francis. Take the Charles Philip Arthur George. Take the Philip Charles Arthur George. William also struggled to get the wedding ring onto Kate's finger when they were at the front of the uh, congregation at Westminster Abbey. What's so interesting about, you know, William struggling to get Kate's ring on or Diana getting Charles's names slightly the wrong way around is, is actually what makes them human, that we are all capable of succumbing to pressure, especially under such circumstances where the whole world is looking at what you're doing. As the crowds congratulated in force, it was at action stations for the press pack, like veteran rural photographer Arthur Edwards. You know that it's the only story in town. You know that it's an exciting day, very early start, at least five o'clock start. Get through the crowds to where your position is. And I had the right pass inside the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. And of course, they looked after us very well. We went there early, got there very early. They laid on a room for us with refreshments and armchairs and television so we could watch the whole of the wedding taking place at Westminster Abbey. And then, of course, when our turn to take up our positions came, it was, it was easy, you know, we just went into position. The prime spot is one which will give the best vantage point of the balcony, a long-standing symbol of the link between monarchy and the masses. The balcony at Buckingham Palace is effectively where the window frame through which we see the royal family. Buckingham Palace was a focal point because the king and queen were there. And as soon as the war ended, they, they made what's called the balcony appearance. So the British people associated the balcony with pomp and circumstance and happiness and celebration. That has always been the case, and especially for weddings. It's exciting and look round and there's people with their noses pressed up to the to the rail railings of Buckingham Palace and they're all excited and can't wait for the royals to come on the balcony and you do some pictures of them and uh, and, it, and it's and that's the build up and then they come up on the balcony and it's just roar and here we go then you start firing pictures like crazy the main picture I'm looking for is the kiss picture. I mean, you know that's gonna be the page one picture. 
And historically, that's not always been the easiest shot to get. When Charles kissed Diana, it was a fleeting kiss, one kiss, bosh, and very, very quick. And many of the photographers there missed it. When Fergie gets on the balcony with Andrew, the crowd starts saying, kiss, kiss, kiss. And I remember Fergie holding her hands up to her ears and they were saying, kiss. And he kissed her for so long. Again, the crowd brought its request. What's that, said the couple, as if they didn't know. Of course they did. And this was what the crowd was waiting for. No matter how good a photographer you were, no one got a snap of Elizabeth kissing Philip. Thousands jam the square before Buckingham Palace and the cry goes up, we want Elizabeth. On the balcony where kings and queens have appeared unnumbered times on great occasions, the young couple happily share the supreme day of their lives with their countrymen. The Queen and Prince Philip, when they appeared on the Buckingham Palace balcony, did not play to the crowds and decided they would not kiss publicly. So a simple wave was deemed satisfactory in 1947. But in 2011, with Kate seemingly overwhelmed... Oh, wow, she says. Oh, oh wow. wow. <laughs> would the kiss even happen? Full marks to her because she pretended to look surprised when she came out on that balcony. She knows that there's always crowds filling the, the, the mall. The only thing that I would say in her mind that she goes, oh wow, as though I didn't expect anybody to be here, which would have been a big fat lie, but I, I love it all the same. It may have also been prompted by the fact that she was a non-royal marrying into the royal family at a very high level. And they, she may still have worried that there might be a little bit of disapproval about that. The stark difference between William and Kate is that William, from birth, was groomed in the soup of pomp and ceremony and royalty. Let's remember when he was born, you know, Diana came down on the the steps of the Lindo wing and almost held him up like, you know, Simba a la Lion King. He's had that from the get-go, whereas she hasn't. So that is the fundamental difference between them, that she's ha she needs longer to get groomed into that system. He's almost got it written into his DNA. I love the way he looks at her looking at her response and he's using a lot of suppressed facial expressions. He's using a suppressed smile, his eyes are crinkling. And I think what that's saying is, you know, look, look at the life that you're coming into, um, as though he's perhaps giving it to her as a gift rather than him giving her to them as a gift, which he absolutely did not want to do. He did not want another Diana situation. So, you know, take the love, but I'm not going to donate you to the public. I don't want that. I want to protect you. As Kate eased into the moment, William puckered up, and down below, Arthur was primed. It was lovely. It was joyful to watch and joyful to be there and, and great to capture. And I remember sending a set of pictures to William and a set of pictures to the Queen. And I remember the Queen stopped me at a, at a school in Windsor she was visiting. And just before she got into the car, she said, thank you for those pictures. And wasn't it a very nice day? I said, it was lovely, man. And I felt on top of the world, you know, she, she liked the pictures. But from some angles, there was an untimely bit of inadvertent photo bombing. Some would say William and Kate's balcony kiss was spoilt by the sight of a little bridesmaid called Grace Van Cutsum covering her ears with her hands, seemingly completely horrified by the cheers ringing out outside. Oh, come on. But then others look at that photograph and just say that it perfectly paints a picture of what weddings are actually like in reality, because there isn't a bride or groom out there that doesn't know that there can be an errant bridesmaid or page boy just about to ruin everything. If the balcony behaviour brought a touch of levity to Kate and William's snaps, Elizabeth and Philip had a much more serious dilemma to contend with in theirs.
following tradition set out by uh, late Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, the Queen left her bouquet at the Tomb of the Unknown Warrior in Westminster Abbey. So by the time she got back to uh, Buckingham Palace, ready for the wedding photographs, uh, there was no bouquet. So when they came to do the official wedding photographs, if you look very carefully, you'll see that she actually isn't carrying her bouquet. So what happened was, during their honeymoon, they had to return to Buckingham Palace, put on their wedding clothes again, and Longmans made a replica of the bouquet, so there she was uh, holding the bouquet. So it must have really irritated both of them. And to this day, nobody knows what's happened to the bouquet. But bouquet or not, did the photos hide something else that was missing when it came to Philip's demeanor? We suddenly had to see this alpha, dominant, very grown up, much older male taking more of a back seat. And suddenly she emerged looking very womanly, looking like a queen, and absolutely absorbing all of the attention in a way that I don't think the two of them had experienced before. And he had to take more of a back seat. She um, threw him a lot of very loving glances, and this photograph particularly is one of them. But it was very much that royal thing of, um, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm the one with the power, I'm the one in control, and I will throw a loving and encouraging glance at you, but you are just not as important in the hierarchy as I am. Elsewhere in the palace, the wedding breakfast had been a further challenge at a time of austerity. There was rationing on everything, on clothes, petrol, uh, food, sweets, you name it, there was rationing. So uh, people found it very difficult and, and struggled in, in providing food. So the caterers had to get creative with their resources. There was always a, a huge amount of game that, that it comes off the royal estates, and they certainly could have uh, kept that, frozen that, and, and used it for the wedding. So they tried to use sort of homegrown produce. There was a little bit of controversy in serving partridge, which wasn't rationed, but then things that fly through the sky in the shooting season, that you blast them out of the sky and you serve it, you've got to do something with it. I think they also had salmon to start with, and to finish with, they had actually cherries and cherries and ice cream. But it wasn't even fresh cherries, it was those glazed cherries and ice cream. However, the budget banquet didn't extend to the cake. It was made by McVitie, who had the royal warrant, and it was nine foot high, and it had 500 pounds of ingredients in weight in it. Um, and they'd used something like 600 eggs. And it seemed the cake fit for a queen could also tickle her grandson's taste buds. The idea of them having fruit cake did seem a little bit outdated um, in the sense that normally these days people opt for some sort of sponge. Um, having said that, the good thing about fruit cake, of course, is that you can cut and keep it. And I think, even since Queen and Prince Philip got married, there have been pieces of cake that have been auctioned decades later. Whilst all weddings need cakes relative in size to the number of guests, some other expenses raised eyebrows. We're told the couple want to strike a balance between an enjoyable day and the current economic situation. But any nod towards austerity is, of course, relative. After all, they've chosen to get married in an abbey capable of seating more than 2,000 guests. And those guests were duly seated in a 50,000 pound fairy tale forest using more than four tons of foliage. Add to that a quarter of a million pound dress. Shit! Thorough processional route rehearsals. And a legion of staff to keep the whole operation going. The final financial reckoning was jaw-dropping. We think that William and Kate's wedding cost around the region of £23 million. Uh, the flower budget alone was £800,000, so it was quite a costly affair. Exact figures for Elizabeth and Philip's wedding aren't available, but it's safe to say that to truly call it an austere occasion would be some way off the mark. 
Pageantry and splendor are revived for this day in austerity ridden London, a day which the world shares with Britain. This is the moment for which the teeming millions have been waiting for months. And perhaps controversially, there had been a less well-known extravagance earlier that week. They had a wedding ball two nights before the wedding, which is a royal tradition that they have a grand wedding ball, and no expense was spared on that. They had, you know, first growth wines and champagnes, and they had a fantastic band, and they, they, they really pushed the boat out, and they have 1,200 guests at Buckingham Palace. And they ended up with the king doing the conga, sort of round the state rooms of Buckingham Palace. Um, so it was a, a very, very jolly affair. With their wedding days done, the two couples hoped to have a relaxing first few weeks as man and wife. But there was very little chance they'd get to enjoy their honeymoon period as outside interference ensured the newlywed gloss soon wore off. using more than four tonnes of foliage. Add to that a quarter of a million pound dress, thorough processional route rehearsals, and a legion of staff to keep the whole operation going. The final financial reckoning was jaw-dropping. We think that William and Kate's wedding cost around the region of 23 million pounds. Uh, the flower budget alone was £800,000, so it was quite a costly affair. Exact figures for Elizabeth and Philip's wedding aren't available, but it's safe to say that to truly call it an austere occasion would be some way off the mark. Pageantry and splendour are revived for this day in austerity ridden London, a day which the world shares with Britain. This is the moment for which the teeming millions have been waiting for months. And perhaps controversially, there had been a less well-known extravagance earlier that week. They had a wedding ball two nights before the wedding, which is a royal tradition that they have a grand wedding ball, and no expense was spared on that. They had you know, first growth wines and champagnes, and they had a fantastic band, and they, they, they really pushed the boat out, and they had 1,200 guests at Buckingham Palace. And they ended up with the king doing the conga, sort of round the state rooms of Buckingham Palace. Um, so it was a, a very, very jolly affair. With their wedding days done, the two couples hoped to have a relaxing first few weeks as man and wife. But there was very little chance they'd get to enjoy their honeymoon period, as outside interference ensured the newlywed gloss soon wore off. Weddings of Elizabeth and Philip and Kate and William are two of the most significant. Her diamond anniversary, the Queen decided to put on a special exhibition of wedding memorabilia to give the public a sense of what a royal wedding was like in 1947. The Queen has put on display just a handful of the two and a half thousand gifts sent from leaders and politicians from across the globe, including this porcelain dinner service from the President of the Chinese Republic. Well, not only was it going to be a splash of colour on the hard road, as Winston Churchill put it, but also the presents really were this first moment after the war in which there was this huge amount of munificence and the idea of royal weddings being a time for giant amount of gifts. Stunning pieces of jewellery were also presented to the couple from the world's elite, but it's perhaps the gifts from normal folk they appreciated most. And they received many, many things, including a cinema, a racehorse, uh, cans of pineapple, cans of rationed goods, there was cans of butter. And one of my favourite presents that they got are two pieces of burnt toast, because uh, these two ladies listening to the radio, they heard that Elizabeth and Philip were going to get married on the radio, and they were so excited that they burnt their toast. And really, bread was really quite, quite sought after at that point, quite expensive. They burnt their toast and they sent it into the palace so Elizabeth and Philip could see it. Such was their appreciation. Many of the goods were re-gifted throughout a struggling post-war nation. Here's a letter that she sent handwritten to one of the recipients. It says, 
Many kind friends overseas sent me gifts of food at the time of my wedding. I want to distribute it as best I can and to share my good fortune with others. I therefore ask you to accept this parcel with my very best wishes. Elizabeth. William and Kate also gave something back to society. William and Kate decided to forego traditional wedding presents. I think having lived together for a decade before they married, they had enough toasters and um, coffee makers and toasty makers and his and hers mugs. So instead they decided that they would ask for charitable contributions. And in the end, they raised over a million pounds for good causes. Then came the honeymoons, with Elizabeth opting for a budget break, split between the home of Philip's uncle, Earl Mountbatten, and the family estate at Balmoral. I don't think Elizabeth would ever have gone abroad. I think it was always her hope to stay in England. And I think that most brides and grooms at the time had very modest honeymoons. It wasn't really a time of overseas travel. It wasn't a time of hopping on a plane and going off to Italy or going off to anywhere. A staycation might have been sufficient for a future queen in the wake of World War II. But fast forward 64 years, and there was no such scrimping for Kate and Wills, who whisked themselves off to an Indian Ocean paradise. William and Kate managed for quite some time to keep their honeymoon completely under wraps. So although we saw them the day after the wedding, because they did a photo shoot in the grounds of Buckingham Palace, they then disappeared. And um, it later transpired they'd gone to the Seychelles, literally to a remote island, I think with only about 10 or 11 villas there. So no prying eyes could get anywhere near it. I think that really shows the difference between a honeymoon, between travel, between notions of weddings, and really, I think, William and Kate's wedding, in which many, many couples across Britain and across the world went on these huge, lavish honeymoons. It shows the difference in the social change, and particularly that William and Kate, even though well, one day they will be king and queen of Britain, they chose not to have a British honeymoon. Yet somehow, the secret of the secluded destination leaked. There were some photographs taken, I think, by an extremely long lens of the couple strolling on the beach in their swimwear. They didn't emerge until months later, I think, in Australia, a Women's Day magazine. Um, what was interesting about it is that the British press must have been offered the shots and rejected them on the grounds that they looked like they completely invaded the couple's privacy. As they approach their 10th anniversary in 2021, Kate and William have some way to go to match the Queen and Prince Philip's 72 years. But both weddings undoubtedly gave the country a boost. While this is by some distance the biggest celebration of the royal wedding across the country, there have been thousands upon thousands of parties as the nation has taken up William and Kate's invitation to be a part of their special day. Even the priests were jumping for joy. Sheer glee. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, look at that. Now, oh. That's something we didn't expect to see, but... <laughs> that is now, wonderful. That's... that sums it up. Yeah. In 1947, there might not have been quite the exuberance, but it signified something to cherish following years of devastation. People after the war were looking desperately for something to celebrate. It was just a moment of happiness for everybody. That day would set Princess Elizabeth on a path to lead her nation for the decades that followed with the constant support of her husband. Now, as the Queen looks to the future, it seems Kate has become much more than just William's wife. I think there's a sense that the Queen and Kate get on really well. Um, they're both quite naturally shy and introverted. Um, I think she admires Kate for the fact that, like her, she said to not have put a foot wrong. She hasn't sought to overpower or overshadow William as he's gone about his role. I think that they're viewed as quite an equal partnership in the royal family. The Queen views Kate as a very safe pair of hands and a very good consort to William. Will she make a good Queen? Well, she's making a very good Duchess of Cambridge, and if she carries on like this, she'll make a very good Queen. When I see William and Catherine now, I mean, I know that the, for the next hundred years, it's going to be great. So if William and Kate are in for the long haul, his grandparents provide the perfect blueprint to follow as they try to balance being married to each other and bound to a life of duty. <laughs>